Quilts, and I'm here with part two of the Harley Treads t-shirt quilt sew along and today we're actually going to prep our shirts I have just taken the shirts they have all been washed and that's the only thing I haven't done any pressing at this point I'm just trying to cut down the shirt sizes so that I'm only dealing with the portions of the shirts that I'm going to use but I'm also cutting them a little bit larger so that I am not mucking with the whole shirt fronts and backs I find if I don't cut them down into approximate size of what I'm using when I go to interface I'm tend to when I go to interface the actual shirts I tend to miss certain parts of the shirt that doesn't have interfacing and then I have to go back and do patch so to alleviate having to do repair work, I cut the shirts down into approximate sizes. Now I have already cut some of the shirts and I have them already sorted, but I just want to show you some of the shirts that I actually received. So here I am showing you some of the actual Harley shirts that I received. So I had 24 shirts in a bag that I received. Some of the shirts are two-sided. As you can see, some of them have a small decal on the front. And then they also have some other larger design on the back. So that's how one style of shirts I've received came. This next style of shirts had where I had two large size decals on the front as well as the back. And as you can see on this particular shirt, I have already cut it apart. The other thing that can happen is sometimes you will get a shirt that may or may not fit with the collection. So again, this is a customer's quilt and this shirt was in the bag and it says Austin Texas and then on the back it says Austin Texas that's how he rolls and so I wasn't sure if this shirt should be included just because something is included in your package that you receive from your customer I always double check to make sure and true enough this shirt should not have been in there so and I'm glad that I didn't cut it so this shirt was saved so he can still wear it and I'll just return that to the customer. And then the other things that I found in the shirts is sometimes some of the shirts were true Harley shirts where they had a Harley logo tag on the inside. So I have cut those out as well if they're actually are Harley shirts then I've been keeping those logos on one shirt it had his a club that had a frog in the name and so I have these frogs on that same shirt it had a little frog embroidery piece on there so I kept that as well and then that's just another Harley tag so on these shirts as I'm cutting out what I'm using from the front or the back of the shirt shall I say I'm also cutting out anything that's a true Harley tag. So I do have a few shirts that I have not cut into appropriate size yet and I just want to show you how I do the shirts. Now if the shirt is for sure something that I know I won't cut anything off with the rotary cutter, I got plenty of room, then instead of using scissors I would just take my rotary cutter with a ruler, lay it onto the mat, and just cut it. So now I have one side cut. I just flip it and do the exact same thing. All I'm doing at this point is separating the two pieces because I have something on the front and the back. So basically just cutting it apart.
if this was a single sided shirt and I wasn't using the backs, then I would just go ahead and cut the shirt folded and not worry about what's on the back to the approximate size that I want of the design that I was trying to get. So now at the top, I'm just going to go across the sleeves. Not the sleeves, actually your shoulder seams. And now when I do that, I actually have two pieces. So now I start with the back piece here. And I just fold the shirt in half. What I have found with shirts is that shirts are not always centered onto the back. So one of the things that I do, instead of going to my iron with this shirt this size, having it face down on my ironing surface and I really can't tell like if I'm covering my logo by so many inches and then I find when I cut that out then I was always short so what I do instead of taking this whole piece to the iron I just spend a little bit more time it doesn't take that long I think I had his 24 shirts all of them were double sided and it has taken me less than two hours to prep all of his shirts. I've already done everything but the ones that I just showed you. And so all I wanna do is just trim, and I can even use a smaller ruler. I try to make sure that I'm like three inches above any of the emblems, so therefore, if it's not centered, I've got room that I can move around with. And then another thing you can do to test and see if you're in the same area is just hold your hand down where the logo is and see if it's in the approximate same space on the other side. And then I want three inches from where the emblem stops. So I trim it there. And then I also do the same trimming on the bottom. And I've kind of got my camera in my way. So we'll just estimate this. <laughs> and again, this is approximate, so it's not a big deal on this. And now my last cut is I want to go down approximately three inches from the side of where my logo ends. And I'm trying to make it relatively square but it doesn't have to be exact. We're actually going to be pressing these in our next step. So it's going to grow a little bit as well. So now this is my cut piece that I just cut out the shirt. And then what I've done is also when I've got three inches around, I've also got a little wiggle room for what I might want to actually cut out in size. So I'm sorting these by logo size so that I have all approximate logo sizes all together. And then when I get to these pockets, the largest my pockets will ever be is six and a half inches square. So I have an eight and a half inch ruler that I just place down eyeball the center. Again, remember that we are cutting everything oversized so I'm going to be squaring up later and just go around my ruler and cut this out. So you don't have to be perfect with this step. And then I keep all of these in a spot as well so I can fuse all like size pieces together. Now on this particular shirt, he has a pocket on the shirt and I am going to press this flat and then I'm actually going to stitch this pocket closed because when I do the quilting, I'm going to do a panto and it's actually going to stitch over the pocket and I don't want this pocket to grab into my hopper foot as I'm quilting. So I will be stitching this very close to the edge down just like it's on the pocket, but I'm not going to remove it or do anything fancy with it. And that was the only pocket that I had in my batch. So I'm going to go ahead and square up the remainder of these shirts and I might even come back tomorrow and finish this off 
and I will see you at the next step. Bye bye. IST, and I have rough cut all of my shirts. I have various different pieces, and I have them kind of grouped by sizing. I have sort of grouped them by size, and the reason I do that is because if I have any scraps of interfacing when I get to that step, then I like to use the interfacing my scraps on some of the smaller pieces and so I will be showing you that when I get to that step. So next I talked about all of the different types of interfacings that you could use on your t-shirt quilt and even one that I recommend you do not use. So I have all of those here. At the end of this video I will do a swatch test and tell you my interpretation of the feel as far as how stiff or soft if the shirt is stabilized or not and I will give you my opinion on all five of these different interfacings but for right now I just want to talk about what I'm doing here so for this quote I'm actually going to be using the EK 130 Pellon interfacing and it is a knit interfacing and it has some stretch to it so let me unwrap some of it and you can pull it and you can see that it does have stretch one way and when you pull it the other way along the salvage it does not have stretch and that's important and we'll be talking about that when I get to the ironing station or to the ironing part of this video so because this is a client quilt I do like to keep track of how much product I'm using so what I do is I just tend to unroll like five yards of this and I measure that out and then I work with five yard increments I find that I can get like a full screen shirt I can get about 11 sides off of the interfacing and also please note that interfacing is not in 44 inch measurements or 42 to 44 it's actually only 20 inches wide so that's another reason why you need so much interfacing when I told you that in the supply video so I'm going to go over to the other side and measure off five yards of interfacing. So I have my five yards of interfacing. Like I said, I like to work in five yard increments so I can keep up with how much I'm actually using. I find that I can get about 11 shirt fronts out of five yards. So that's how I kind of do my estimates. And then, and I'll meet you at the ironing station. You would be happy for me. So I'm at my ironing surface and I have brought my interfacing that I have my five yards and I have a shirt here that I'm going to press and the way I'm doing this is that I want to make sure that my top and bottom of my shirts are on the width of my ironing surface. On this portion I'm going to have to do a voice overlay because I forgot and left my television on. But here I was checking to show you the stretch. When you stretch across the width of your body, you've got more stretch than going up and down the side of your t-shirt. So what I've done is I've put my logo so that it's the width of my ironing board, the top and bottom. And I turn it over and the first step that I do is that I press my shirt. I am using steam in my iron. You don't necessarily have to, but I like using steam. And it also will help with the fusing process that's coming later as well. Next, I lay my fusible 
interfacing on top of the shirt and I cut out a piece that's slightly smaller than the t-shirt. I tried to make it about a half inch shorter. I'm going to use my scissors and I'm just going to rough cut it out at this point. And there I'm just showing you where you want to cut a half of an inch. Now when I put my inner facing down I'm going to make sure that the straight of grain is along my top and bottom because I want to stabilize the stretchiest part of the interfacing and I'll be showing you that when I get this trimmed. So there you saw where I was just pulling on the interfacing and there you can see where that's the stretchier side of the interfacing and it's going to go along the sides of the logo. On the top and bottom of the logo is where you are going to put the straight of grain of the interfacing. So now that I'm laying it back out onto the shirt, I just want to cut it about a half inch shorter than the shirt. Now that piece I do keep, I keep all of those pieces. I actually have no waste with this process. I actually use those leftover pieces that I cut off on another shirt and we'll show you that later. The next step is to take some water, although that bottle says faultless concentrated starch, it's actually water, I ran out of that starch. But I like to spray it with water. Now the um, interfacing instructions tell you to use a wet, cloth to lay over the top of this interfacing and then press it but I just want to do this very quickly so I actually spray with water and then use my press mat and I also still have steam in my iron and I just steam it down that way. I take about 30 seconds on each covering of the fusible sheet so I just keep going back and forth. I don't really count I just estimate and then I will also do a check when I'm done to make sure that everything is fused. So again, I just leave it for approximately 30 seconds and then I will lift this mat up and cover the rest of the interfacing t-shirt that I want to fuse. And then I will iron again for another 30 seconds or so. Now I am making sure that the shirt is fused all around the edges because if it's fused around the edge I probably did a very good job. And I am actually going to switch to another shirt because I don't want to pull on this shirt since the interfacing is still warm. And to show you how the shirt looks stabilized. So here's another one that I've done previously. And you can see now the width of the shirt doesn't move as much as it used to. It actually has a snap to it. And on this side, it has a snap as well, although you can't hear it because I had to do a voice overlay. But I just wanted to show you how the sh shirt was stabilized. It's got enough stability without being too stiff. Now we're going to show you what I do with the leftover pieces. After I collect so many pieces, then I just go in and I fill in the back of another shirt. Or I can also use these smaller pieces on a smaller t-shirt panel as well but since I had long pieces here I just go ahead and add them down spritz it with water and then go back and add my mat 
And where you see I have empty spaces, as I go along, I will be cutting scraps that I will be filling those extra spaces that you see. I estimate that I can get 11 shirts from a five yard piece of interfacing and then I can get a 12th shirt interface by using the extra pieces that I created as I was trimming. So this method again has no waste with it at all. I actually use all of the interfacing. Time estimate for this, I would say that it takes about three minutes per shirt because you have to iron the shirt. Then we cut a piece of interfacing and then have to trim it down to size if it's wider than the shirt. And then the pressing part. So I estimate about three minutes per shirt. It could take a little longer. And then I'm just showing you where in the future I would be adding some interfacing to finish that shirt off. I do want to show you how I interface the section of fabric from all of the interfacing, so stay tuned for that as well. As promised, I'm back with my swatch test. What I have done is I've taken one t-shirt so that I know that they're all the same weight and I cut five five and a half inch squares from those t-shirts. I then cut a five inch piece of stabilizer to stabilize the t-shirt so that I can test for stiffness as well as stability. So this piece here is just a plain t-shirt and I'm just going to hold it with my finger in the middle just so you can see what the drape is. So this is the drape of a t-shirt that has no stabilizer in it. And then when we stretch, this is the cross stretch of the shirt that goes across the body. And then this stretch is not as loose as the other stretch. The interfacing that I use to put on these shirts, again, is the Pellon Easy Knit EK130. And I'm hoping that I can get this to focus. There we go. That is this interfacing here on this shirt. And I've just used scraps since I just put this on my shirt. So I'm using up the scraps for this sample. But it still has the same feel to it. And this Pellon Easy Knit is the same as Fusey Knit 1300-1 HTC that I get from Amazon. So you can search that as well. And... The thing I like about the Fusey Knit from Amazon is that it comes on 30-yard bolts. I don't pay any shipping or tax, and so my price for that is $2.22. The Pellon that I purchased at Joann's last time costs $4.29, and you can get a coupon for $40, $50, very rarely for 60%. Also, make it a little cheaper there, but... I have a hard time finding it in jo Joann sometimes, and I have to go to more than one store to get enough. So it just depends on their quantity there, as well as I tend to write the prices down so I know if the prices has increased on me as time go along. And then for the weight test on this, I have my finger in the middle, and you can see that it still drapes, so it's not very stiff and then when I pull it the width wise you can actually hear it snapping now because of the interfacing but again you still have drapes so it's very pliable it's not stiff the next interfacing is similar to the Pellon Easy Knit it's the Pellon Sure Knit is EK135 and it cost $3.99 the last time I purchased it. And you really can't tell a difference here when I'm using it. I'll put the original back on top as well. But this makes a big difference when I'm using jerseys and jerseys has those little pinholes. And if you use a white interfacing behind the jersey with the pinholes, then you will see the white interfacing. Whereas if you use the clear it doesn't look like anything is there. And I don't have any jersey that I can actually show you that on. And again, you know, it's the same thing. So you've got the same weight here. 
and again the stretchability this way over the stretchability here so it's still the same very drapeable it feels like it's still a t-shirt but it's not as stretchy and let me show you the bolt in for that one let me show you the bolt in for that one and I think I forgot to show you the bolt in for the fusy knit since we're still sort of kind of on the same topic because they're kind of similar. So there's the bolt in for the fusy knit that I actually purchased on Amazon. The next interface in is Pellon White Shape Flex. And this is actually my favorite interfacing. And it has a number called SF101, but this one costs a little more. It actually feels like a piece of very thin cotton, like muslin fabric that ha is a fusible. And it actually stabilizes your shirts very well. And let me show you the bolt in on this one as well. So there's your bolt in for this one. It costs $6.99 per yard. So it's a little bit more costlier than the others. However, when I feel down, when you rub your hand on this, you just feel like it's muslin. And I like that it gives it a little bit more shape, but it's not too stiff. So I can still put my finger under here. You can still see some drapage where it's still doing pretty good here. And again, this one costs $6.99 a yard. And then when we go to the back and we pull and tug, this is our width wise. You get a little bit more of a snap. And then a little bit more stability here as well. So this is probably the preference for what I would recommend using. But again, this one costs a little bit more. So if you're cost conscious, then I would use the knit. Our last interfacing is the Pellon. 80F Craft Fuse is $2.49 and that's why I think a lot of people tend to use this one. I have this by the boat. I buy this by the boat as well and that's because I use it a lot in my tote bags or anything that I actually want to be stiff and this number is 808. So I also put that one onto the back of a block. And then when I pick this one up and I put my finger in, you can see that I don't have as much drapage as I have with the other interfacings. And when I go to the back and I tug and pull, it is very, very stiff. It's very stiff. And you could probably use this if you like, but I just feel like it takes away from the cuddleness of the quilt itself if you're making a quilt most times you want to be cuddling with it so i would be careful with using this i'm not saying that you can't maybe be cautious if you're also going to put t-shirts on the back of a quilt which i'm not going to do but i'm still not going to use this i just prefer craft use to be used in crafting projects as far as like tote bags placemats um pin cushions or something where you want something to be very stiff and you don't want it to lose its shape. That's when I actually use the craft fuse. So that is going to be it for this video. Next time we come back, we will be working with getting some shapes sewn to go into our quilt top. So if you have anyone that you know is interested in making a t-shirt quilt, please share this video series with them. I will be making a playlist that I will be adding a link to at the eye above. So please, please share this with your friends, your members of your quilt gills or your social cups. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye.